Shalom and uh, welcome to the Middle East Report. In this program today, we will be marking the 40th anniversary of the International Christian Embassy in Jerusalem, famous for the Feast of Tabernacles. And with COVID-19, it's going to be a different feast this year. So please watch the Middle East Report. Warm welcome to the program and uh, today's guest is originally from South Africa but has been living here in England for the past 18 years. Uh, Mark Starbuck, warm welcome to the program. Lovely to be with you Simon. And uh, you're here representing the International Christian Embassy um, uh, UK branch but can you share with us first uh, how you came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Well as you mentioned I grew up in South Africa so uh, I grew up where Christmas is sunshine and a uh, barbecue and a swimming pool in a different hemisphere. And uh, I grew up in what you could really say was a Christian family. My f parents were brethren. And of course, I was also part of a, a choir in the cathedral in Cape Town. And so I grew up with church. But it is an amazing thing that while I grew up in church, I grew up without God. And it was only later in my teenage years uh, when I'd gone on a bit of a wander and had got myself mixed up with some, shall we say, undesirable people. And I ended up in what you could really call a sort of a reformatory for boys, but not in the same way. It was certainly a home that had a ministry of rescuing, rescuing kids that were going in the wrong direction. And it was there on the 12th of May 1974 that a young congregational preacher came in and uh, he spoke about Matthew 5 and verse 6, blessed are they that hunger and thirst after for righteousness for they shall be satisfied. And I just had a whole lot of things happen in my life. I just lost a young friend who was part of our musical band and it really got me thinking about my life. Uh, where I was going, what would make me satisfied. And that night, I decided to try Jesus. And I'm so glad that I did because that's literally shaped the course of my life. So the 12th of May, 1974, in a place called the Teen Center in Cape Town, I gave my life to Christ. Fabulous, that's amazing. And um, when did the Lord really give you a, a love and a heart for Israel and, and a biblical understanding of his plans and purposes for his nation? Well, I went into the ministry as a really young man. I was already leading my first church when I was 20 years old. And uh, it was probably about six or eight months after that, uh, that I met uh, the love of my life, my wife, and uh, we got married in 1978 and it was a few years after that when we were uh, thinking of starting a family and we thought well before we do that let's go and see a bit of the world <clears throat> my wife is part norwegian in her background so we thought well let's go to norway and amongst the places that we decided to go to was to go to israel now, I was already in the ministry, and so my first visit to Israel in 1980 was really more of a tourist visit, you know, to see Jerusalem, to see Galilee, to see the Dead Sea, and uh, that was our first visit. Anyway, it was a couple of years later, <clears throat> we were now in another little town where we were doing some church planting, and a young couple uh, came up to be part of our congregation that were from the church led by Malcolm Heading. Now, that may not be a name that you're familiar with, but Malcolm Heading was a colleague of mine. I was part of the Assemblies of God. 
And they came back all very excited about a trip that they had just been on to Israel. They said, you've got to go. You've got to go to Israel. You've got to go to the Feast of Tabernacles. So they put a tour together. They came to our church in 1981. They'd just been to the 1981 feast. And so this was now looking to 1982. So 1982, we went to our first Feast of Tabernacles. They had just moved to the BHU, the Binyanea Hauma, which is the International Convention Center, where uh, the feast was held for like 30 odd years. And um, so that was our first experience, you know, and there were all of these luminaries of the Christian world, Derek Prince, Lance Lambert, Jamie Buckingham, David Pawson. And it was just such an amazing thing for us to actually hear these preachers and be part of that event. Anyway, we came back to South Africa and, and Eugene, this guy that had come up from Malcolm's church said, I am so passionate about Israel. I'm going to start a travel agency. And the purpose of the travel agency is going to be to help Christians and Christian ministers go to Israel and uh, not just Israel, but to go to the feast. So he said, I want you to write all the brochures. So why should a Christian go to Israel? Why is the Feast of Tabernacles important? And so I thought, well, okay, I can do that. And that began me on a journey of discovery where suddenly I began to realize, you know, that Israel's a lot more than a tourist destination. It's a lot more than just going and seeing the Sea of Galilee and having a falafel and that type of thing. And I began to understand the power of God's covenant and the power of God's promise and how that this nation was God's redemptive womb and, and God's redemptive vehicle, uh, that they brought Messiah the first time and they were going to be deeply involved in bringing Messiah the second time. And of course, part of that was also producing a brochure about the Feast of Tabernacles. And it was like just a journey of discovery as I started to understand what the meaning of the feasts were, how they fit into a pattern and a purpose. And this feast, the Feast of Tabernacles or Sukkot, how it is the feast that is yet to be fully fulfilled. And it is a feast that speaks of the future of a day when the harvest is gathered and the people of God are assembled in the presence of God. And that was just an amazing revelation to me. And that was really the birth of my passion for Israel and my interest not only in the nation and God's plan for her, but of course, the Feast of Tabernacles. Excellent. That's a brilliant story, Mark. Uh, and, and do you want to share with us as well what actually the Feast of Tabernacle, Tabernacles actually means? Because, I mean, thousands of Christians, thanks to the work of ICJ, bring thousands of Christians to Jerusalem to march the streets of Jerusalem to um, show their flag of their nationality and show that love and support for, for Israel and uh, the Jewish people. So it's a very special event. And, and also it's one of those really nice Jewish festivals, um, Sukkot Absolutely. or uh, Feast of Tabernacles. Well, in simple summary, there are three big convocational feasts. So we know the one as Pesach, uh, Passover. Then we have Shavuot, or what we would call Pentecost. And then, of course, there is Sukkot, or what we would call Tabernacles. And with each of these great feasts, there's a clear Christian event that we can associate with it. So when it comes to Passover, we can associate the death of Jesus, Easter, the, the lamb, the blood, um, and there's a clear connection there. And when we come to Pentecost or Shavuot, there's again a very clear connection there, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the beginning of the church age, the beginning of mission and uh, ministry and so on. However, when we come to the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot, there is something about it that is not fulfilled. It still has this future perspective to it. And 
maybe one of the ways in which we can best understand it is to look at its agricultural name, because a lot of these feasts would also have agricultural names. And the Feast of Tabernacles is called the Feast of Ingathering. So it is a feast that takes place after the harvest is gathered in. And so that to me is an incredibly significant sort of picture that this is an event that happens after the feast, the, the harvest is gathered. And when we think of the sort of outpouring of the spirit, that was a festival where the harvest was released. It, it, it was sort of a, okay, go get the harvest. But tabernacles is a celebration after the harvest. And it almost speaks of a time where things will have been brought to a close, where from a point of view of Jesus and the Messiah, the Messiah will have come and we will be in the presence of God. So it has this future resonance to it. And when you look at a text like Zechariah 14 and verse 16, where it talks about the uh, celebration of the feast annually in what we would call the millennial kingdom, and it talks about how the nations will come up and year by year they would celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. Again, it's very interesting, you know, because you would you would think, well, why wouldn't they celebrate a Passover, you know, I mean, the death of Jesus, the, the blood, the sacrifice, the resurrection. Uh, why wouldn't they uh, celebrate Shavuot, you know, the, the beginning of the uh, church mission, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Why tabernacles? And it has this mystery to it. It has this sort of sense, well, maybe this could be the anniversary of the return of Jesus. We don't know. We're not going to put our heads on a block about it, but it, it has this prophetic dimension to it. And this is really what triggered some of the early Christians, when I say early, late 70s of, of the last century, um, to actually begin gathering uh, in Jerusalem. They saw it as a prophetic uh, feast and uh, they began to say, well, come, let's anticipate uh, the coming of the Lord Jesus. Let's anticipate the day when we will be celebrating this feast. And of course, they began to gather. I think the first one was in 1978 and uh, just a little handful of them. And then, of course, in 1980, uh, they gathered and that's when all the embassies had left uh, Jerusalem and uh, uh, on the back of that, the ICJ was birthed. So the Feast of Tabernacles is almost the birthing ground of the ICJ ministry. So that's a little bit, I mean, there's a lot more to it, obviously, but that's a little bit of why we feel celebrating the feast is so important. It's like we're anticipating the return of Jesus. And uh, I mean, it's also congratulations to ICJ. I mean, I've done a lot of work with the organization and I think your organization is excellent. You've got branches all the way around the world. Yeah. Uh, and the Feast of Tabernacles is really the highlight of your calendar, uh, bringing Christians from all over the world to Jerusalem to worship the Lord in his city, the eternal city of Jerusalem. Um, but can you share with us where it all began 40 years ago? Because this is a very, very important year for your organisation. Well, as I mentioned a moment ago, 1980, uh, Menachem Begin, the Prime Minister of Israel, um, declared Jerusalem as the eternal undivided capital of Israel. And there was a, an outcry uh, led mainly by the Arab nations at that time. And as a sort of a protest, uh, pretty much every embassy that was based in Jerusalem relocated down to Tel Aviv. And as you can imagine, for this young nation, that was like a, a tremendous blow, you know, that the whole world in a way had given them a smack through the face. And the Christians gathered to celebrate, or a Christian group gathered to celebrate the feast in 1980, and they, they felt the pain of Israel as a nation. And 
they felt led by the Lord to actually open up an embassy. Uh, and that, that that embassy would not have the full consular status that a national embassy has. It wouldn't be an embassy in the sense that uh, you have the UK embassy or the uh, USA embassy, but it would be a representative voice of Christians around the world who would be saying to Israel, you are not alone, you are loved, we pray for you, and we want to support you. So that was the sort of birthing of the ICJ 40 years ago, and that's why 2020 is significant in the 40 years. And out of that small, humble beginning, developed a ministry that today, as you said a moment ago, literally spans the globe, has branches all around, and has consistently held the Feast of Tabernacles for 40 years. Of course, if it wasn't for COVID, we would indeed be holding the 40th celebration of the ICEJ Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem, but uh, we're not going to do it in quite the same way. So let's have a look at this uh, excellent report that tells the story of how ICEJ came about 40 years ago. Jerusalem, 3,000 years old, yet today a very modern city. Jerusalem is the vibrant capital city of the modern state of Israel and the seat of Israel's parliament. It is also the only capital city in the world which does not have a single foreign embassy. Why? In 1980, the Israeli Knesset passed a law which was called the Jerusalem Law. This law stated that Jerusalem is the undivided and eternal capital of the state of Israel. In protest against that law, the Arab League called upon an emergency meeting threatening all the nations with an embargo which would recognize Jerusalem as being the capital of the state of Israel. Consequently, all the embassies which have been located in Jerusalem at that time, they closed their doors and moved to Tel Aviv. For many Israelis, the departure of the embassies proved to them again that in a time of need, they could not rely on the international community, but they would stand alone like so many other times in the course of their history. Yet just as the last foreign diplomats were leaving for Tel Aviv, more than 1,000 Christians from 40 nations were gathering in Jerusalem to celebrate the biblical Feast of Tabernacles. The participants and the leaders of this gathering, sensing the isolation of the Israeli people, decided to establish an international Christian embassy in Jerusalem. While this is not a political or accredited diplomatic embassy, the International Christian Embassy Jerusalem today represents millions of Bible-believing Christians worldwide who stand in solidarity with the nation of Israel. So why should the city of Jerusalem be so important to us as Christians? First of all, the Word of God declares in Psalm 132 that God's presence would dwell here forever. And secondly, here in Jerusalem, all major events which shaped and impacted our Christian faith took place. Just a few miles from here in Bethlehem, Jesus, the living world, became flesh and dwelt among us. Just outside the city walls of Jerusalem, the Son of God died for the sins of the world, and there he also rose from the dead. From the Mount of Olives he ascended to heaven, and one day his feet will again stand here in this same place. And here in Jerusalem, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit would come down, fill the early believers and empower them on a powerful mission to engage the entire world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. But then finally, the city of Jerusalem might be holy for many people, including us Christians, but the Word of God promises the city of Jerusalem as an eternal possession only to the Jewish people. 
That's why it is called the city of David. And the word of God says that one day this city of Jerusalem will become the spiritual capital of the entire world. For that reason, the Jewish people have returned here to the land of Israel. Therefore, it's no wonder that the prophet of Zechariah declares, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am zealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with great zeal. With great fervor I am zealous for her. Thus says the Lord, I will return to Zion and dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth, the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. This is why the International Christian Embassy is being located here in the heart of Jerusalem, representing millions of Christians towards the nation of Israel and the city of Jerusalem. And we want to be a very practical blessing in many different ways to the nation of Israel and also to this very city. We want to invite you to partner with us, to join us as we support the nation of Israel, as we stand with Jerusalem. We are your embassy here in Jerusalem. May the Lord bless you out of Zion. And uh, that's an excellent video explaining the history of how ICEJ came about. But uh, thankfully now, due to President Trump moving the US Embassy to Jerusalem, there are a lot more embassies following in the lead of not only President Trump, but certainly of ICEJ. Uh, Mark, do you want to share with us um, the, the, the work of the embassy uh, in Jerusalem uh, and what it means for Israel, knowing that this is the focal point for Christians around the world who support Israel to stand with Israel and the, uh, the Jewish state. Yes, Simon, I'd love to say a few words about that. So out of that initial sense of needing to fill a vacuum, you know, when these embassies left, uh, we wanted to step into that and be saying, representing Christians around the world, Israel, you are not alone. But of course, we couldn't just hold a feast every year. We had to do a lot much, uh, much more than that. And so it, it began to, you know, become a bit of a journey in terms of discovering how could we become a ministry of comfort, a ministry of encouragement and support to Israel. And we began to discover some really practical things that we could do. For example, that we could help Jews to return uh, to Israel. And so we began to work uh, alongside the Jewish agency um, with uh, the program of Aliyah. And I think as I speak to you now, um, we've probably been involved with about 160,000 Jews that have returned to Israel in terms of helping to sometimes find them, uh, then to prepare them and to uh, finance their flights where uh, that is needed. And then once they arrive in Israel to help them uh, settle into the new country, language, accommodation, uh, just helping them to sort of get oriented in this new land. So that has been a very powerful work. Uh, we began to discover that there were lots of needs socially within Israel. Uh, we, we, we don't always appreciate that there's quite a lot of uh, you could almost say difference. There were, there were people in Israel that live quite well. There are others on the other spectrum of things who actually really struggle. And there's a lot of poverty, there's a lot of need. And we began to discover that there was a need for people sometimes just to be helped with food. Um, and so a, sort of some type of social care ministry was started. Uh, we came across a whole uh, group of Holocaust survivors 
who were now well up in their years and who were living in destitute circumstances. And we partnered with um, some agencies up in Haifa to start the uh, Haifa home for Holocaust survivors. And now um, there's a whole street in Haifa, not just one building, but numerous buildings. And I, I always thought it was just the most amazing gesture that the group that came over and helped to finance and refurbish the purchase of the first home, the first property, was actually the German branch. And uh, just, just an amazing thing, you know, when you think of the Holocaust and that it would be the German branch that would contribute financially uh, and in time and in resource to actually make that first home possible. And they've been involved just quite recently. I think last year we had a team over from the UK that was helping to uh, refurbish another building that's been purchased. So that is an, a great example. Um, there have also been other areas where we've become involved. Uh, Yad Vashem, and uh, we established a partnership with Yad Vashem and opened the Christian desk at Yad Vashem. And again, just to, to think about that, you know, what Yad, Yad Vashem stands for, and that we were able to actually position a Christian desk so that Christians visiting Yad Vashem would be able to have not only the Jewish perspective of what happened, but also a Christian voice. So there have been numerous, numerous uh, um, ways in which ICJ has made a difference in Israel. One fascinating aspect, we've spoken about the feast. Well, over the years, uh, the tourism profile of Israel has literally changed. So you would have thought that Christmas and Easter were the major times when Christian tourism would come. It would be the peaks. Well, now, because of our involvement over the years with Sukkot and the Feast of Tabernacles, it is now this time, right now, September, October, that is the busiest time from a tourism point of view. Excellent. And uh, Mark, you have a unique role within ICJ, yes. and particularly when it comes to the, the Feast of Tabernacles, or in Hebrew, um, Sukkot, where you are actually the chaplain yes. of, of the feast. Uh, should we go to this video now that uh, actually shows Mark's role uh, during the Feast of Tabernacles? My name is Mark Starbuck and I'm uh, actually an Assemblies of God minister, uh, first in South Africa and then back in the UK where I lead a church in Southampton. Here at the feast, I am the feast chaplain. If I was to describe what I see the chaplaincy role is, is obviously to manage the devotional program, then to provide pastoral care. So that, that's just being there, moving among uh, the feast team, talking to them, having a chat. But I want to take this text and just sort of lift it out of this context and actually look at, at four um, thoughts or principles that I believe sort of capture some of what it means to be blessed by God. And there are four words I want you to take note of. The, they are fruitful, multiply, fill, and rule or reign. And when we look at in our In the beginning, lives, arrival are... one is just your dancers and musicians. And uh, it's a smaller number. And we would tend to just have one devotion with them in the morning before they go to their rehearsals. 
Then a few days later, we have Arrival 2, and that's all of the sort of techies and stage crew and uh, the media guys that come in. We still do the one uh, devotion at the Yitzhak Rabin, which is where we stay. Um, and then once Arrival 3 comes, which is the sort of uh, bulk, uh, the ushers, security, all of those guys, we are at that point moving to the Pious Arena, and the feast is about to begin. Once the feast begins, we we have about three to four devotional slots every day. Every year it's a home for me that I have a family here in the Feast uh, Tabernacle Dance Company and I have uh, gained friends, I have friends here from different parts of the world and we, we have this relationship not only as brothers and sisters but also friends and uh, as a family. The main thing that we try to do is just to help people, first of all, you know, have some type of spiritual input because there will be guys here that actually never um, get to be in a, a feast session. Uh, they, they're like some of our logistics guys, they're literally out working, uh, moving uh, equipment and stuff like that. So um, we, we want to make sure they get some spiritual input and that it's, uh, you know, really ministers to them. Um, Beyond that, it's just making sure that people are happy, that you know we we are trying to provide an experience for them that would make them want to come back again, to understand a little bit of what they're involved with, so what the Feast of Tabernacles is about, what ICJ is about. It's busy, and uh, you know, we try to make sure that everyone realizes that the feast is ultimately it's about being in the presence of God. It's an amazing experience really because here they are almost all professionals and I'm still a student so it's really a great opportunity also to grow with my technique but to praise the Lord with the, such great dancers that we have here and we can really feel the presence of the Lord in the arena or at Engedi. It's really an amazing experience. To do a, a feast, typically we need about 200, uh, but as we grow the feast in the future, that number is going to have to go up. I'd love to extend an invitation to you. If you're watching this video, come and serve with us. Come and be part of a life-changing, history-making experience. Let's see you at Feast 2020, serving on the feast team. God bless you. Thank you for watching Encounter Israel. We hope you were blessed by the teachings and stories here in the Holy Land. To learn more about the International Christian Embassy Jerusalem and how you can be a blessing to the nation of Israel, visit icej.tv. We look forward to connecting with you. And uh, I think you agree with me there that uh, Mark would make a, a pretty good uh, news reporter there. A great report, Mark. I really enjoyed that one. And um, can you share with us um, some of the challenges, but also some of the, the, the real blessing of being uh, a chaplain in charge of the, uh, of the feast uh, and looking after the whole team of ICJ? Because it's, it's a huge event and it has to be probably the biggest event for, for Christians in the Holy Land. Yes, Simon, it is a massive event. And I think one of the things that struck me from the beginning, now I was the feast chaplain or a chaplain from the beginning. So my first involvement in this role was in 2007. But initially I was also part of the worship team. So uh, I can remember um, early August 2007 getting a call from Malcolm heading early in the morning. Hey, Brew! Uh, <laughs> is a typical South African greeting. And they asked me to come and play guitar because, of course, I'm also a musician. So I went over and it was sort of a, a, a little adjunct. And oh, by the way, would you also be the uh, chaplain? And so my first sort of six, seven years of being involved with the feast in this way, I was also part of the um, worship team, initially as a guitarist and then in the, the last few years as uh, a vocalist. 
And so a lot of my memories um, stem around some of the moments associated with that. Um, there is one particular memory I can remember coming off stage at Engedi. That's our opening night down in the desert. Amazing. And if my recall is correct, I think this was 2012. And coming onto stage uh, at that moment was Angus Bucken. And uh, I, I remember just greeting him and saying, God bless you, and, and then uh, stepping to the sort of side backstage and just uh, um, watching what was happening, cooling off, because it had been an extremely hot day. You know, down there at the Dead Sea, it is sweltering. And I caught out of the side of my eye some flashes of lightning. And I thought, oh, okay, that's interesting. We're going to have a storm or there's a storm somewhere. And uh, he was beginning to preach about the, the Holy Spirit and about the wind of God. And quite literally, as he spoke, a wind came up. It, it started to blow TV screens, these massive video screens down. Uh, in those years, they used to put shade cloth over the stage and this wind was catching the stage cloth and, and, and starting to lift the whole stage. This is the power of the wind. And, and there is an image that sticks in my mind of uh, Angus Bucken with his hat, holding his hat with this microphone and the wind blowing. It, it, we had never seen anything like it before. And in the middle of all of this wind, it starts to rain. You know, we're one and a half thousand feet below sea level. There were Israelis there that it said in all of their lives, they've never seen or experienced anything like that. That was a very powerful memory as we just felt the, the might of God, the presence of God in that situation. One of the other things that I get to enjoy every year is that we, we have new uh, uh, team members. They come to the feast for the first time. And part of my role as chaplain is not only to look after them spiritually, but to introduce them to Israel and to, in, in particular to Jerusalem. So we, we do a couple of fun things. And one of the fun things that's become something of a tradition is we do a sunrise walk. Uh, up to the top of the Mount of Olives. Really nice. Now, because we have to do this on a Shabbat, uh, there's no public transport, and our guys, our drivers, are obviously also resting. So we set off from the Yitzhak Rabin hostel at about 4.30 in the morning, and there's normally a group of about 60 or 70 of us, and we're walking, and we plan to get just to the sort of top of the Mount of Olives as the sun is starting to come up. And it is a beautiful moment. You know, people who have never been to Jerusalem before, or some that have, just to go up there to pray, to worship, and just to watch the sunrise and know that one day on that same mountain, not far from where we're standing, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, will come and his feet will stand on that mountain. It's a beautiful moment. It's the sort of thing that we, we that become part of the rich memories of your heart and your life. Absolutely. Uh, and what is it like for... Um, those who want to take part in the activities of ICJ um, that come from all over the world and, and their first experience of Jerusalem, their first experience of, of the feast. Well, one of the things that we make clear to all of our volunteers is, is this is not a holiday. Uh, while we will try to do some stuff for you that will take you touring, will take you up the mount, you've come to serve, you've come to work. And so a lot of them are very mature in that respect. They, they know what they've come. They've been well prepared by their branches and their churches. But I think there is still a sense of awe, you know, when you, you know where you are and, and you, you have that sense of excitement about being in Jerusalem. Uh, when you step onto the stage of uh, the Pious Arena, or as it was for many years, the, uh, the BHU. And every year, the stage is built 
we, we build a stage. So you're literally stepping onto something that's never existed before. And you get to dance, you get to sing, you get to play. And there, there are times of worship that happen when the hall is completely empty and we just, as it were, anticipate the presence of God. And then the nations gather and, you know, there, this great arena with countries, uh, India, China, Africa, America, Finland, South Africa, you name it, and they're all got their flags. And uh, it's, it's just, the, for me, it's the most amazing anticipation of what heaven will be like one day when all the nations are gathered in the presence of God. So I think for anybody who serves at the feast, uh, it sets something up. You know, once you've been once, you want to go again, you become part of a family. We even have a Facebook group called the Feasties. <laughs> and uh, we're like a little family of friends. And once you've been a Feastie, you're always a Feastie. Sounds, sounds good. I, I think I remember uh, back in 2006 and uh, yeah, attending the feast and um, just listening to uh, the famous and the great Lance Lambert uh, speaking, yeah. which was which incredibly powerful and incredibly yeah. moving. Um, sadly, I missed the chance of seeing other great preachers uh, like Derek Prince, but uh, uh, never mind, we're in a different age. But how has um, COVID-19 uh, affected not only the work of ICJ, but also um, the feast this year? Because we see that Israel during this time of high holidays from the start of Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, uh, Yom Kippur we've just had, and now going into Sukkot or the Feast of Tabernacles, the whole of Israel is in lockdown. I mean, yeah. extraordinary times. Yeah. Well, I think Israel, like so many parts of the world, has been devastated by uh, COVID. If you think of this time being a major tourist time for Israel and how dependent they are, the bus drivers, the kiosks, the uh, various sites that have literally been locked up. Um, so Israel as a nation, uh, its medical system, its businesses, its commerce have suffered greatly. And the work of ICJ has been affected Inevitably, we've had some of our key staff members who have been trapped uh, away in their home countries and some have not been able to get back to HQ, to uh, Israel. Um, others have had to work from home. Um, so there's been that sort of impact. But in the middle of it all, our team has carried on. Uh, they've carried on delivering um, packages um, of food and giving support. We've, we've even had some specially um, commissioned Aliyah flights that have come in. Uh, there was one amazing story of a woman who was allowed on a plane and literally, uh, if I recall the story correctly, gave birth as she arrived in Israel. Wow, um, so she had her children. One of the first things she did in Israel was give birth. Um, and and it, it, it's a very powerful ministry that has continued. Um, obviously, we've not been able to have the sort of impact in terms of bringing crowds of people into Israel for the feast this year. We've had to be incredibly creative and this year we're moving the feast online. So let's have a look now, and this is how you can be part of uh, this year's Feast of Tabernacles. You don't need to travel to Jerusalem. Watch this. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say to them, The feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, these are my feasts. The fifteenth day of this seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days to the Lord. The Feast of Tabernacles is not a feast of the International Christian Embassy Jerusalem, but the Bible says it is a feast of the Lord. It is a time when God wants to meet with His people in a very special way. Since 1980, the Lord called the International Christian Embassy to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles here in Jerusalem. Each year has become a time of refreshment for God's people with unique testimonies of healings, of prophetic callings, and even how God is impacting entire nations. 
This year, because of COVID-19, you will not be able to come to Jerusalem. But today, I have exciting news for you. We will bring the Feast of Tabernacles to you. From beautiful locations right here in Israel, you can celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles in your living room and churches with the biggest program of live events and seminars that we ever produced at the lowest price ever. Join us online from Israel as we begin the Feast of the Jordan River, where John the Baptist started his ministry to prepare the way of the Lord. Experience a global communion service from the beauty of the garden tomb. This year, your nation can still be represented in Jerusalem for the roll call of the nations from the Southern Steps, the site that led to the temple in the time of Jesus. See the land of Israel through the eyes of local Israeli pastors and worship leaders. Hear uplifting messages presented by global speakers and international worship artists. Enjoy a vast selection of over 50 uplifting seminars and messages that will change your life. Watch the feast online October 2nd to the 8th, live from Jerusalem, and have access to the content through the end of 2020. Go to feast.icej.org to register and find out more about this year's online feast package. Inquire about how your nation can be presented at the Roll Call of the Nations in Jerusalem. I look forward to seeing you, and I'm so excited for what the Lord will do as we join together from around the world to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. Register today at feast.icej.org. And uh, sadly, none of us can be in uh, Jerusalem this year, but uh, we can certainly be part of Feast of Tabernacles. And uh, that video showed everything that you needed to do. Uh, it is strange, very strange times, the fact that uh, almost global travel has come to a complete yeah. halt. And, yeah. and uh, many of our viewers, particularly watching this program, will certainly miss being in Israel That's and right. certainly miss uh, not being in Israel for the, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles. But you know, what can they expect, Mark, um, by going online and uh, allowing the Feast of Tabernacles to come from Jerusalem to come to people's homes all over the world. That must be a unique experience. Well, I think the first thing that we can say is, as, as Jürgen mentioned there, we have put together probably the biggest package of content that we've ever done. Uh, you know, there are 50 different seminars you know, with 50 different topics. Uh, and some of them are like little mini-series. So you can do a mini-series with Malcolm Heading on Christian Zionism. And there are a multiplicity of topics and themes. Then there are these sort of plenary sessions, if you want to call them that, the sort of big sessions with a worship team and a speaker and so on. And a lot of that content has been pre-recorded. So we were fortunately able to get a lot of it done before they went into another lockdown. And there are going to be these beautiful venues, whether it's the steps leading up to the temple, uh, at the old Robertson Arch area, or whether it's down at the Jordan River where um, John the Baptist used to baptize. There are these wonderful places that have been selected for these moments. So visually, in terms of content, in terms of being there, it's going to be a wonderful window into what the feast is all about. Is it going to be the same? Well, no, because, you know, it's different when you're looking at your computer or your, your TV as opposed to being in an auditorium with thousands of other people. But under the circumstances, it's still going to be fantastic. Now, when you go to feast.icej.org, you will get the opportunity not only to learn about the program and to learn about the content uh, that is going to be available, but you will be offered two a record, a registration 
distribution packages, one for $50 and one for $99. And the $99 package just adds a few little items like a special journal and a communion set with the 40-year uh, uh, sort of logo on it. But all of them allow you to access the content. So you get a registration um, login so that you can go online and you can then watch the sessions and you will have access to all of this through until the end of the year. Uh, those who buy the more expensive package actually have access to it for the next year. So you don't have to try and watch all uh, 60 or 70 um, items or streams at once. But it's a fantastic uh, opportunity to be part of this year's feast. Uh, what difference do you think it makes, have, we're only down to the last two minutes or so, Mark, but what difference does it have to actually bring this all online and have this content rather than actually doing nothing for this year's uh, feast, particularly as it marks your 40th anniversary as a ministry? Well, you, you know, I was part of the conversations that were happening earlier in the year and it was, shall we or shouldn't we? Will we or won't we? And we had these sort of timelines at which we had to say, okay, we're not going to be able to do a feast. At first, we were hoping for a small one. Uh, and then it became clear that we were not going to be able to do one at all with an audience. And so moving it online from a logistics point of view, from a creative and media team point of view, has been a phenomenal job. You know, doing all the recordings, getting all the speakers lined up, making sure that they produce their content, that it's up to a good standard, and then doing all the editing and the prepping. You know it, you're in the media uh, business. This is not a small thing to put together 50 different seminars just on that uh, basis. And uh, Mark, with about 20 seconds to go, uh, do you want to speak to our viewers about why they should be involved in this year's Feasts Tabernacle, your 40th anniversary? Well, folk, it's been a joy being able to talk about ICJ and about my involvement with the Feast. We'd love you to join us. Go online and register. Uh, if you can form a little group and register as a, a household and watch together, I know you'll be blessed. And as I often say, we'd love to see you next year in Jerusalem. Uh, Mark, thank you so much for being uh, my guest on today's Middle East Report. Thank you so much for sharing um, your own personal journey, but also the important work of ICJ. Been thank a pleasure, you. Simon. Thank you. And I want to thank you for watching today's programme. Sadly, none of us can fly to Jerusalem. None of us can be part of the Feast of Tabernacles, but you can online. So ICJ is a great organisation doing tremendous work in standing up for Israel and the Jewish people throughout the world. And the Israeli government knows the important work of ICJ. So if you can't be in Jerusalem, then get involved in the Feast of Tabernacles online. So I want to thank you for watching today's Middle East Report. Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. He goes before me. He goes before me. Defender behind me. Defender behind me. Oh, and I won't fear. anointing Shout right.
right there. <laughs> <laughs>